This video was made possible by our generous supporters on Patreon. Welcome Bradley J. Erickson, our new Patreon this week. Visit our Patreon page to vote for next week's video. Weapons free, my friend. Weapons free. What defines the boundaries between good and evil? This question has remained deeply ingrained in the human psyche since the dawn of mankind. Countless stories have been dedicated to finding a definite solution, a final answer to the question. It's one of the most conventional themes in literature, a universal component of the human condition. Since childhood, we are taught to think in binary, to create black and white solutions to our problems. Denis Villeneuve's Sicario presents a different way to think about a big problem the war on drugs, indicating that the line between good and evil is blurrier than we ever thought. Nothing will make sense to your American years, and you will doubt everything that we do. But in the end, you will understand. Roger Deakins' cinematography is impeccable in this film. Villeneuve and Deakins successfully define the setting by mostly dry desert tones, predominantly using the color beige to express neutrality, alluding to the complex nature of good and evil. Something Sicario excels at is how it manages to build tension, especially in situations where the motives of characters are unclear. Villeneuve and Deakins expertly combine their skills to heighten the tension and sense of unpredictability, slowly revealing information to the viewer. A key component in this is composer Johan Johansson's brilliant and disturbing score, which really gives key scenes an added level of suspense. The use of violence in the film is brutal, but it's never overstated. Every death is shown to have important consequences for both the victim and the killer. Fuck! Taylor Sheridan, the film's screenwriter, also did an excellent job at establishing an environment in which nobody is safe, where there are simply no good and bad guys, as those terms lose meaning very quickly in the film. We are never told who to root for. Different characters are introduced, and this comes with different perspectives. The efforts of Matt Graver's team try to re-establish order through force. Dramatically overreact. But others are drawn to corruption through easy money. <laughs> and still, others do what they can to feed their children and keep a roof over their heads. And others are repulsed by this out-of-the-box way of getting things done. What are we doing? All of these different angles help keep the movie morally ambiguous, and in the end, the viewer must make up his or her own mind about what decisions they agree with. Do we get an opportunity of the men responsible for today? The men who are really responsible for today, yeah. I'll volunteer. We see most of the film through the eyes of Kate, an idealistic FBI agent who has no idea what she's getting into. Neither does the audience. She's intentionally kept in the dark about what's going on for a good portion of the film. What's the password? In the beginning, Kate is seen wearing mostly blue, representing her tendency to want to do good in the world. She wants to make a difference by playing by the book. However, when she finds out what it really takes to make a true change, a new question arises for Kate, and therefore for the audience to answer. Do you really want to make a difference? Or would you just like to pretend like you're making a difference? As she begins to learn how the operation really works, she becomes more and more conflicted about the mission. Especially when she finds out the CIA only used her for all the illegal activities to happen. If the movie was strictly narrated through Kate's point of view, like most traditional films would, we would probably reach the end of the film with the exact same perspective as Kate, the ends don't justify the means. However, new points of view are introduced that give us a different outlook on the situation. Your wife, you think she'd be proud of what you've become? Benicio Del Toro steals this film, he really does. His character Alejandro represents the alternative perspective that challenges Kate's approach to solving problems. 
Some people have mentioned that it's jarring how the movie really follows Kate as the fish out of water character for the majority of the film, but the climax is all about Alejandro. However, in this way we get to experience him on a first person intimate level, and this is the only way to really see the impact his approach has on the mission's success. Former Colombian hitman or not, it's undeniable that his methods are effective. Brutal, illegal, yet effective. Alejandro acts as an influence character for Kate, who is the main character. Josh Brolin's character, Matt Graver, plays a similar role for the overall impact of the story. You're giving us the opportunity to shake the tree and create chaos. That's what this is. They both act as a way for Kate to question her ability to solve problems. From the very beginning, Kate doubts Matt and his team, who they really are and what they are capable of doing. This puts a boundary between them that prevents them from getting efficient work done together. Kate sees it one way, they see it another. This creates an interesting relationship that counterbalances the more logistical problems going on in the story. Matt and Alejandro undermine Kate's ideals throughout the film with their own cynical view of morality. State Department is pulling an agent from the field that specializes in responding to escalated cartel activity. You'll be part of the team. Do we get an opportunity of the men responsible for today? The men who are really responsible for today. Keep an eye out for the state police. Tengo un hijo. What is lo que haces ahora es por tu familia. Okay, you volunteered to get on this train because you you know you're doing nothing in Phoenix. Okay, you're just sweeping up a fucking mess. In six months, every single house you raid will be rigged with explosives. Do you want to find the guys responsible? We're not even scratching the surface. Doing what we're doing. So why are we talking about a film that came out three years ago? Okay. Besides being another great work in Villeneuve's already very impressive catalog, it's an important movie. It examined many ugly aspects of the war on drugs that other filmmakers may try to avoid, while still doing it in a cinematic way. How it's turning the quote-unquote good guys into the very monsters they are trying to defeat. The truth is, drugs aren't going anywhere. Matt mentions in the movie that unless somehow someone manages to convince 20% of the population to stop using, the war will continue. So the real question by the end of the movie is, is this brutality the only effective response? Is insanity the only way to fight insanity? The film acts as a reflection of ourselves, our internal drives, fears, and motivations. Our own internal struggle, not just with the horror out there, but with the evil within. Clean fucking out, my friend. In the end, the mission was a success. Kate wanted to make a difference, and she ultimately did. The team got the guy who was responsible. But by the end, it's not satisfaction nor relief that is felt. Whether Kate decides in the end that Alejandro's tactics are the only way to make a true difference, or if she decides she won't become a ruthless killer like him, is left for us to decide. But there is something that we can be sure of. You cut the head off a snake and two more grow back. Alarcón is killed by the end of the film, but the gunshots heard at the children's soccer game remind us of the cruel reality. These events will continue to go on, without meaning and without reason. The idea that there is a clear distinction between good and evil is revealed in the end to be nothing more than a children's game. But the inescapable future awaits. <laughs>